to, to have this hour with you and really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, we are going to be talking, here's our agenda today. We're gonna to be talking about proactive data governance and how that uh, is important in managing risk. And in fact, uh, given the, the rate of growth of data these days, um, being reactive may no longer be a choice for, for many organizations. And then we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into uh, data mapping and talk about uh, the importance of really understanding where your data is and, and really uh, you know, take a playbook, a practical approach, if you will, uh, to data mapping. And then uh, in a similar fashion, uh, talk about uh, building a privacy program uh, within your organization. And of course, at the end, uh, hopefully there will be time for a Q&A, but feel free to uh, submit questions as we go along and we may uh, just pause here and there to take some questions. Uh, but before we go any further, I'd like to ask the panel to quickly uh, introduce themselves, uh, beginning with Leo, please. All right, go. Can you guys hear me okay now? Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you, John, for the opportunity. Thank you, Colin, for uh, helping put this together. Um, as I mentioned, I lead our uh, operations team at Salesforce as we go in for a corporate affairs team. Uh, we uh, broadly uh, look at driving uh, and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of our legal and corporate affairs team. And obviously, data is, is a big component of that. So I look forward to the opportunity and, and be able to share some of our thoughts with, with this group. Thank you, Leo. Uh, KQ, please. Hello, I'm Kimberly Kwan, or KQ. I head up eDiscovery and forensics at Juniper Networks. And my background essentially was um, law firm, transactional, and IP, then in-house doing both as well. And then I went into the service provider side and I picked up um, a heavy technical background working at Oracle. And so I kind of look at my world, which um, converged with eDiscovery as being the really interesting intersection between um, legal and data. Look forward to speaking with you all today. Great, thanks KQ. Looking forward to hearing more about data mapping. And then Justine, if you will, please. Well, hello, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Oh my gosh, not the crowd that you wanna have technical difficulty with in the morning. My name's Justine Phillips. I'm an attorney at the law firm Shepard Mullen, and we are gonna to talk today about some of the trends we're seeing uh, in data governance, some of the litigation, some of the risk. Uh, my background, we do holistic information governance, um, which we like to call digital asset management. We'll talk a little bit about words um, and also incident response, data breaches, um, and carrying some of the risk forward for the organization. So really excited to be here and really appreciate you guys for putting a thoughtful panel together. Yeah, thank you very much, Justine. Very excited to have you on, on board here. Um, so just jumping in and, and setting the table a little bit, you know, last time we talked about legal operators and the primary audience here is legal operations and legal operators. Um, and, you, you know, we started with the premise that the legal operator is really this role, an emerging role, if you will, uh, that is connecting legal and business and aligning the OGC with the, the business, the overall business. And what we're finding over time now, and even in my engagements with customers, we're seeing that legal operations is really becoming a backbone role, if you will, um, being able to communicate not only within uh, the legal department, the customers within the legal department, but we're seeing them engage across and collaborate across the enterprise more and more. And um, you know, whether you're starting a new legal ops program or you're revisiting some programs that you're uh, that you've already established or kicked off, legal operators with Colin here has developed a framework, if you will, for which you can just have some benchmarks and some checks. So process, legal technology, spend optimization, data analytics, and, and benchmarking. These are what Colin calls the four pillars, and I thought it was really helpful, actually, from that perspective. And then on our first uh, of the three parts here is our first part, we, we really gave a high level overview. So we had uh, Eric Iverson, who is now at uh, CTO at a, a AWS uh, uh, Media and Entertainment. And he, you know, he came across this role and he said, legal operators, wow, this is truly where the rubber hits the road when it comes to bringing the legal department and engaging the legal department with the overall business. And he was super excited about the role and, and then um, James Scher from Baker Hostetler, he talked about 
um, legal as being the X factor, as really being essential, uh, an essential consideration when building out any legal ops programs. So we hear uh, the three-legged stool talked about every day, most, you know, you know business, uh, so people process technology, but legal oftentimes gets, you know, forgotten. And so we wanted to bring that back to the perspective for the legal operator. And then finally, we started with uh, Jesse Murray at Lime talked about, um, you know, creating a playbook. And he took uh, legal hold as an example and really, you know, d dove deep into the customer journey and really, you know, understanding what your customer needs are and who those stakeholders are that might be impacted by any legal ops programs and building out playbooks from there. So, Leo, a day without a legal event is a good day in any organization. But for some organizations, that's probably more the exception than the rule. So it'd be really great to hear your perspective on where you see data governance and how that can impact uh, your overall uh, risk mitigation and, and optimizing business outcomes. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. And again, thank you, everybody. Uh, this is really, uh, as we evolved our server legal operations team here at Salesforce, uh, we started out really just focusing initially on efficiency, really just almost exclusively on as the work comes into the legal department, how can we help transform the organization so we can handle the work uh, more efficiently. Uh, but as, uh, as, uh, as our journey progressed, we really started dabbling into areas where we can more proactively uh, you know, support the department in, in reducing what of those sort of potential risks of the company actually become issue. So in some ways, it kind of plays it back into efficiency anyway, because you just have less work coming in. But more importantly, it really just ultimately more directly contributes to that objective of any legal department, which is to, to protect the company and minimize, you know, the exposure. Um, and the way our team has been supporting the department uh, in that journey specifically is through data. And interestingly enough, we'll, we'll talk in the subsequent slides, but it's really not as much about our own data, but it's really the, the, the enterprise data and looking through the, the set of data across the enterprise for uh, signals of risk. We actually ended up building a data science team within our uh, small legal ops team specifically focused uh, on that. I think we can uh, move on to, I have control over this slide. Um, the, and then this is really the paradigm where sort of we uh, traverse our sort of journey uh, looking at data and, and really the importance of uh, data governance. Uh, as we started our journey focused on the efficiency, uh, you pretty quickly figure out that getting your own data in order is important for efficiency, right? You're, you're gonna be able to understand uh, for your where your agreements are, what are your commitments within your agreements? Uh, what are the issues that are open? What are the investigations that are open? Uh, so all the things that describe the work of legal and compliance, uh, that you, to the degree that you have a better grip, better quality of that data, it, it sort of really directly impacts the work that the team is doing. And that's really described as for more of that horizontal green uh, box there. Uh, really about the business of legal. Uh, but as we shift to that, that role of really just more directly contributing to the risk management, and you really pivot um, the, the, the paradigm and really look from a corporate risk management perspective, and then you start looking across all of the data of the enterprise, and actually particularly the non-legal data, to try to predict risk areas, right? What are the the transactions that we should be paying sort of proactive attention to? What are the areas that we should be doing additional proactive training on? What are the areas that we should have uh, greater communications to the team? Really just having that data tell sort of the, the, the leading edge of potential future risks and allowing the department to act on that well ahead of those risks becoming issues for us. So that's been uh, transformational for us as a team in terms of legal ops, but also uh, put us squarely, uh, more squarely back into that, that, that uh, space of corporate data governance. Uh, we, you know, we came into that really looking again at our own data and how we govern our data as every department did. 
Uh, and now we're shifting towards this role where we're actually more of a stakeholder that everybody else maintains their data with some degree of quality as well. Because to the degree that the finance data, security data, uh, product marketing data is maintained in a better state, that proactive risk management that we're applying uh, works more effectively as well. And not to say about obviously the discovery component that goes with that as well. So that has been a little bit of our journey and how we pivoted uh, into really being sort of stakeholders uh, for the broader uh, set of corporate data. The, so uh, that kind of led us to like, what does it mean to be a stakeholder in that uh, corporate data set, right? So then you start getting into more uh, core uh, data elements like there's a dish data dictionary and data lineage within the company that uh, that we can consume and leverage, but other others can consume and leverage, right? Um, we have visibility across that data dictionary of who owns what data uh, mm -hmm. and who has responsibility for it. So obviously you end up becoming in the organization for that. Um, you know, access security goes hand in hand with that, you know, goes to the quality of the data, who has access to the data, who can manipulate the data. And really at the end of the day, allows us on this last point to, to bring what we're bringing to the data. Is, is the data science uh, from a legal perspective, from a compliance perspective, mining that data, identifying potential risks, and then not only creating uh, what our data science team does, which is really called risk index. Uh, so for example, in a, in a particular training area, we may look at how you know, we use uh, Salesforce tool called uh, Trailhead, uh, for a lot of our, our training internally. And there's, it's kind of like a gamify and there's quizzes along the way. It's amazing for anybody who hasn't seen it yet. Uh, but we can also then get it deep into that data and see what's the accuracy rate in those quizzes along the way for some hot topics that we may be interested in and then deploy some incremental training to those teams that may be doing. They've taken the training and sort of checked the box in that way but the data underneath it um, showcases there might be some incremental opportunity. And obviously, uh, data is a great storytelling platform. Uh, we've been lucky to uh, bring into the Salesforce family uh, Tableau as a, as a key element of our platform uh, more recently. Uh, so we've been leveraging that quite a bit to then visualize those results and really compel, create the compelling visual that people need to act. Right, that's just data has, it not only allows you to sort of behind the scenes find the risk, but really an impressive visualization often compels movement within within the enterprise to, to act on it. So that has been a little bit of our journey. I don't know if, John, if you wanna pause and take questions along the way, if you wanna save it up for last or? Yeah, no, I thought I thought some some really interesting points just to, to recap a little bit and, and KQ and Justine, please jump in anytime. Um, so really interesting, I hadn't heard before that a legal organization looking at data holistically, identifying potential risk areas, seeing opportunities for lifts in minimizing risk, then creating programs around that, potentially even gamifying programs, and then this idea of a risk index. So I guess the question is, how do you, what's your recommendation to do something? How do you start with something like this and how do you implement it? How do you enforce it? In, over time, you know, say the, the organization lives on and on without Leo, that type of thing. So. Yeah, I think that one of the um, the, the, the kernels uh, to me, uh, and I was seeing that in kind of, you spoke about legal ops uh, early, uh, it's really what I'm seeing, and not only that, you know, the, there's, we've been talking for years now about this, this sort of growing trend of legal ops, what I'm seeing also is the change of the makeup of the professionals that make up those groups. I would say probably, in the earlier days were mostly folks that were already in the legal department. They had more of an operational bend to sort of their, what they wanted to do or how they saw the world and sort of drifted towards that space. Um, we took a different tack on that. I mean, a little bit of my background, I didn't grow up in legal, so I came on more from the operations side. Really brought to bear, you know, professionals with specific background and expertise to the legal department, right? And one of those uh, great hires for us has been 
a team that's really data centric of business system analysts, as well as a data scientist team. Right? So those, so you gotta, you're not gonna break into this space by, it's harder, call it, somebody just morphing, and anybody really should be, should focus on that, that, that purpose built uh, talent to it, particularly in the data space, right? And I, and I think you start really there. You start by having somebody in the forefront mining the corporate data and bringing forward some of those nuggets and early wins, mm -hmm. which then allows you to tell the story. So look, this is the kind of thing we found. Now, it might have taken more effort than it would. Uh, it might have taken longer than it should uh, because it's, you know, it's a small group. Data, some of those frameworks were not in place. But you can show the value of that finding and then sort of continue down the journey. I think it's very important to get quickly to value uh, to tell the story. So I want to comment um, and then ask a question. Um, at the risk of sounding like a complete and total nerd, Leo, I am obsessed with the data dictionary concepts. Um, I often will tell clients, you're all speaking different languages. This is Babylon. You know, your finance department is speaking in numbers. Your legal department is talking in terms of, you know, requirements and risk. Your HR department is talking about it in terms of employee um, perception. And we have to have a common language. So the idea of a data dictionary is wonderful. And I want to know where that came from and how that has been for your organization. Yeah, uh, I think it comes from, in most organizations as, as well as, as ours, it comes from, from a three fronts, right? One is that the sort of a COO-ish type roles in different business units that, that are bumping into the same challenges of trying to run their business and looking for a common taxonomy of data. Um, it comes from typically the security team that needs to, and, and just and as you know, it is, it is critical today for any company to know what data you have and where it is and how it's controlled and who has access to it and so forth. Um, you know, trust is the number one value at Salesforce, so we've been, uh, that has been in the forefront for a long time. And, and, and teams that are focused on risk mitigation sort of came in as a sort of a third not to, to borrow John's like uh, three-legged stool analogy, but as the as a third leg on the stool, right? Um, we support uh, not only sort of a, a broad, you know, within the groups that I that, that we support as an ops team, uh, we have enterprise risk management, uh, we have risk uh, ethics and compliance, we have uh, audit, uh, both internal audit and SOX. So all those groups are really about trying to understand risk across the enterprise and understand how, and then you need to understand the enterprise data and you need a common dictionary. Now, with all that being said, it's not easy, right? Because it requires every one of those teams uh, that own the data to have some, you know, so a couple of key teams that are really particularly interested in data, but it really requires other teams that really own the data to want to play. Somebody needs to create a central framework, and we have that. And then you need to get, make sure that all the teams participate and then speak to their data, right? They can speak to what, what does data mean, what it doesn't mean, where is that, what it's not at, et cetera. I love it. I'm stealing yeah. it. So a couple Thank of questions it. from the audience here. Um, so, uh, I, first off, I apologize if I butcher your name. I don't have my glasses on. Huge mistake. So it's Sheila Grilla. Grilla. Uh, she asked, um, how or when do you check on the systems programs after implementation via audits if audits are outside vendors used? Um, if I can take a first crack at that, uh, one of the key things that we focus on um, you know, we're lucky to, to, to be a software company, so we you know, have lots of reporting uh, uh, tools at our disposal, and more recently, the additional Tableau. But we make sure that every implementation that we make, uh, reporting visualization is always part of it. So from the get-go, and even teams that are deploying those, those solutions for my team, uh, immediately after uh, deployment, we start a cadence of reviewing data both reviewing data for ourselves to understand adoption and use, reviewing that data with the business owners of the application so they understand the trends and patterns, and ultimately to the point where 
that use of that data becomes sort of a part of their day-to-day -day operations. We have some teams that uh, within, you know, have many teams within our legal team that truly use uh, reports dashboards for their staff meetings. That's how they run their meetings today, right? So the data doesn't become a, something that you check afterwards. It's something that you, you leave and breathe every day and it really runs your day-to-day. -day. You know, some people refer to it as sort of a, a data-driven business, but it's that's how you, I think the idea of like checking data in, in, in the rears and periodically is just a recipe for like periodical disappointment and to that sense. Terrific. And I think Sheila had a follow-up question on who should be working on these data dictionaries, if you will, or indexes, indices. Uh, I think the answer was it's really cross-collaboration across the enterprise uh, contributing to a data dictionary. Yeah. Is that correct? And I think, John, in your experience, you'll probably see a lot of that too. Who who comes to the table, right, for, for that kind of work. Yeah, I was going to save that question for uh, Justine and KQ uh, down the line there. Uh, so I've got it on the back of my mind. <laughs> All right, Leo. Great. Well, thank you. OK, uh, so did you want to move on to the next slide or? Uh, uh, we can. I mean, just uh, just to wrap this one up. I mean, if we, I think we've, we spoke about this uh, already, but that notion of identifying your objectives. What are you there for? Are you looking at driving efficiency within your group, or are you looking at uh, to mitigate enterprise risk? Uh, then you're gonna, as Justine mentioned, you gotta derive meaning from the data. You need to have some kind of lineage dictionary that can really use that data to life. Uh, and then you gotta close the loop, right? You gotta take that data and take those conclusions and apply it back into the business. And to me, the rhythm of this third point is what keeps the machine alive. If you don't if you don't close the loop, it becomes a bit of a theoretical kind of a, a exercise and, and usually just sort of dies off. So uh, those three things so that's what worked for us and you know hopefully this, this helps the team sort of advance their sort of data data journeys. Absolutely. Thank you, Leo. So um, KQs, really important is understanding where the data is. So if you don't know what you have, you don't know your risk. And you know one of the, the fundamental things for any organization, I would believe, uh, in terms of being proactive about data governance is data mapping. Yes, exactly. So um, this is what I love. It's taking all that knowledge that Leo talked about and it's uh, putting it somewhere where it's useful, essentially, in some kind of a representation that people can reference. So I, I thought maybe I should just um, level set and explain what, what my definition of data mapping is today. And I think uh, back when I worked in um, databases, it was crazy. It was it was data sets with trying to, trying to map fields and other, other elements um, here with regard to e-discovery and IG. It basically is an inventory of your data and um, your data through an organization. And that data can be, um, it can be paper, like back in the day, we still do have paper around, and ESI, obviously, electronically stored information. So essentially we have um, the what, which is the data itself, as I said, that exists in and across the organization. And then the who is who uses it or has access to it. And the how is, um, how is it administrated? And that could be, is it secure? Is it current? Um, how is it retained, held, archived, deleted, et cetera? So that's kind of the, the basic starting point here. In terms of actually creating a data map, um, I think it's important, as Leo talked about, uh, to understand the goals. And you know there can be different reasons to have one. Um, I'll use the example of e-discovery. You kind of want to know what you have throughout your organization that may need to be be um, retained and collected for lawsuits and investigations. So you need to build the scope, obviously, and get executive buy-in because it's a huge task and it's organization-wide. So getting that buy-in is really important. Um, secondly, I advise you to rely on both technology and people to flesh out the data sources. 
And by technology, I mean you could have um, logs telling you what, what type of data is being exchanged. You can have um, purchase, purchasing inventories that tell you what applications are being used throughout the organization. Um, and you can have databases full of servers and other control factors that you hope and um, obligate your people to keep current. And then the people, the people that you interview to actually um, get the subjective value of the data. Um, what is it needed for? How long do you need to keep it? Um, what type of data is there? The privacy concerns, which Justine will get into more later. And then in terms of, you know, you have to think about even after you've built the map, you need to review it um, occasionally and figure out if it needs to be revised. So figure out what schedule you want it to be on and what events might kick off you know, some kind of unscheduled review. So a scheduled review might be based on regulatory changes. So once a year, take a look, um, merging data types, something happening throughout the organization and new applications being deployed or decommissioned. And then um, an unscheduled event might be a merger where you need to look and see what's coming in. Um, do we want to pause here for maybe some questions or John any I kind of thought that you might have some insight based on what um, Congruity is doing and you know that helpful information that gets gleaned from there. Yeah, no, this is really great Kiki. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as you're speaking here, we got a question come in from Edgar and uh, plus one from Jonah and it's a question for uh, KQ and Leo is uh, you know, really, it's more of a comment, but it would be you know, nice to hear your feedback. I know, and, and, and Edgar says, I notice organizations are afraid to acknowledge the need for legal ops. Traditional legal departments focus on litigation, but there is a huge need for operators to harmonize engagement with our business partners. Yeah, so um, in my work for many years uh, with global consulting firms, I worked with Fortune 500 clients and almost without exception, they embrace the importance of the legal ops org. And um, this, this uh, led to a lot of growth. Um, I would say that it's really important if you don't have a specific legal ops um, dominion or charter in your company that working with folks like, you know, legal operators, learning, associating, networking, seeing how other people do it, learning who you should be kind of collaborating with and coalescing within your organization and creating value there can really lead to, you know, the um, at least the spark or the thought of creation of a, um, of a recognized institute, basically. Leo, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I um, think that's, uh, that's spot on, uh, you. And, and I think that it, to, to, you know, what made sense uh, for Salesforce to work on the journey, and I think it makes sense to potentially to others as well, is this notion of this dual role that the ops can have. One is focusing internally, when you're really trying to enhance the efficiency of the department. We're all trying to do more or less. Uh, you know, there's, it is a more constrained reality to to the space department. Of, uh, I think Britain stretched their resources further uh, in terms of what we can accomplish uh, for making the risk the company goes a long way. That's where I see most legal ops teams really just anchoring their sort of a, sort of kind of first birth to the uh, they can bring uh, to that component. Uh, and then you really sort of add forward into beyond that, can we support the mission uh, of mitigating risk to the device? And you get in the space of, of data, uh, you know, data science, uh, enablement. We have a big enablement practice that it really tries to find the best way to enable and educate the enterprise so that, you know, again, mitigates risk. 
Uh, so there's a lot of things that legal ops can do to proactively uh, integrate with the enterprise to, to mitigate risk before they become issues. Yep. Mm -hmm. If I could just share my observation on this is I think organizations would love a legal ops department. I think the skill set is a hybrid professional between legal and technology is something that is pretty rare. Um, the KQs and Leos of the world are just harder to find. It's also a cost center. Legal ops can be a cost center to an organization. So justifying the cost back and Leo, to your point, it's also can be from a risk perspective. It's like you got the scales of justice. You're going to pay me now or pay me later. And for legal ops, um, cultivating internal skills like everybody on this call listening, you're starting to learn now what it takes to become a legal operator. And um, I think those skills are very much needed and are actually you get more value for legal operators uh, on a legal team rather than playing whack-a-mole on the back end for class action litigation and managing that. That just has to be explained plainly to leadership. Once they understand it, once you maybe visualize it, which definitely helps break down some of the barriers on language, I think you're in a much better place. Um, so great question yeah. though, really thoughtful question. So true. And unfortunately, I found um, with a lot of my clients that they do not move towards um, this type of creation of such an invaluable body until it's it's reactive, until they've gotten bitten. And so um, there are plenty of um, anecdotal, you know, historical stories in the news and elsewhere that we've all experienced that could or should really lead an organization to um, to be proactive about legal ops, but um, it doesn't always happen. So, great. Next, um, I I just wanted to say, um, okay, here's kind of the skeleton of one data map. So there, here are some components. I'm not going to go through each and every one of them because I don't want to put you all to sleep. But basically, it's um, it's, it's a mapping or a list or a graphical representation of your data across the organization. And so um, this, is, this is only a myriad of um, properties that you could include. And it, it could be different depending on the purpose of your data map, the nature of your data, and the nature of your business. But essentially, you can see here that you want to identify the data, what it does, what kind of, what kind of format, um, you know, the type of content, metadata, privacy considerations, confidentiality, um, all the policies around it, where is it located, how do you get, how do you access it, who do you need to, you know, contact, and who's running it, who's using it, um, who's renewing the license on it, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This list could go on and on and on, but, it's a good idea as an organization to put together the skeleton as part of the, um, the scope, essentially. Absolutely, and, and, and just to drive home the point of the value of proactive data governance and the value of a legal operations professional within an organization. Um, and this is you know, a question for Justine to, to start off and maybe for the rest of the panel. But having, I mean, from, from Leo's earlier slide, we saw stakeholders that were uh, across the enterprise that had a, a, a say in uh, the data and the data strategy and data quality and data governance. Now you have um, data mapping as a proactive initiative. So when you have an event, a legal event, you know, let's, I, I saw M&A on your previous slide, uh, KQ, but I'm thinking more data breach something like that. How important is it, first question, to have a data map? And the second question is, who's gonna be sitting at that table uh, for response? Right, and I'm, I'm actually gonna go backwards to this slide now that we talked about what a data map is, why create one? And obviously the, you know, the moral to the story is you want to know what you have, where it is, and why you may or may not need it. So um, these points are, are very, um, you know, they make sense. Data silos make audits and legal events a nightmare. You know, again, if you don't have a data map and you try to figure out where everything is, 
Um, it's very, very difficult to do when you're under the gun. So these are just um, good points in terms of, again, as Leo talked about, um, you, you need to know what you have and where it is. So KQ, if I could just add to this from a, from a breach perspective, oftentimes we'll get involved and we might have a hardware software map. It might show how we're connecting. Um, it might provide a nice visual, which is great. But from a legal perspective, I'm really interested to know what data, where's our crown jewels? I think of mm -hmm. data in three ways. What makes you rich? What's going to ruin you if it's lost? And what has to be regulated? And so knowing where your pockets are and knowing what you have when your breach starts out allows us to very quickly develop a plan with the key stakeholders to go after from a forensic investigation perspective, go after those areas. So pulling log files back on major databases for customer, consumer data, um, really understanding where HR data is living. We've seen tons of data breaches. Thank you, COVID, for ruining our lives. And um, But when we made it easier for employees to access uh, work from home, um, we made it easier for threat actors to access those same systems. And so what used to be anomalous activity of a lot of people logging in is no longer anomalous because everybody's logging in remotely. Um, so having a data map and it's rare i will tell you like we work with a lot of clients on ig and and did mapping out their digital assets by the way it's a living breathing document it changes all the time you get a new vendor in and also not just limiting it to your on-prem and you know your esi and your and your paper records which now thanks to ccpa we we get to map um, but also having all your vendors, like what relationships do you have with them and building that in? Um, it can be the difference between a one month investigation and a one week investigation. So mm -hmm. it is it is a huge game changer. So having a data map is a great luxury. And it, in my view, I love a data map that also shows hardware software. So not just myopically looking at data sets, but also building in the layered approach. So you have some depth there when we're really talking about how do you secure this data? That's an excellent point. Um, also in regard to data breach, uh, having a map is really uh, important in terms of trying to explain to your regulators later what you did once you learned about the breach and um, to make sure that you have properly retained everything and that you can show the activity. Um, so again, I th we could go way into another, another topic there, but really, really important. In Regulators, to vendors want to know, auditors want to know, you know, the ENYs and the Deloitte's of the world, they want to know that your financial controls are secure. Yeah, there's so many, so many compelling reasons. So what I always recommend is because data mapping KQ, as you know, is the expensive piece and it's, you know, you can put policies in place to be compliant, um, but really to be compliant and to know your stuff, you have to map your data. And it's a huge cost, and so you have to justify the cost. So you put down all those great reasons for your organization why mapping data is the most critically important. And we'll talk a smidge about CCPA and CPRA, which are laws that really require you to do it. Um, but yeah, it, it is something that you have to document, and it's kind of like the, do I stay in this relationship or not? What are the pros and cons, right? Do I like this boy or not? You have to, you have to visualize it and, and be very intentional about what arguments you make and then break out that cost-benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Leo, any final points on that? You'd like to add? Uh, no, I think just uh, uh, just brought forward is, is, is absolutely the case, and maybe the one thing to add is that uh, having, uh, and I know that you all agree that having a uh, that discipline, and I'm not sure if it's really a, a luxury, but uh, it also plays a, a big proactive role in security, right? So it's not just when in support investigation, but hopefully, uh, you know, it positions you well to understand where data is, understand that the data is where you think it is, and it's protected as you as you think it is. So it really help mitigate uh, the need for, for those investigations uh, for those well. Mm -hmm. So KQ, any final takeaways? 
or um, I was just gonna, I was just going to go over an example of a playbook um, in terms of dis discovery response and and how a data map can really help you with that. So uh, potential um, a real or potential litigation case comes about. And right away, having a data map allows you to um, to understand the the data sources because you have your potential custodians, hopefully, and you can look at uh, you know what they're touching, and then you can also think about your privacy considerations at that point. Easier to effect preservation. Um, you further interview your custodians to validate and build your discovery plan. Um, and again, you know who these people are, and you can find out where you need to network even further in terms of both um, custodians and data. Uh, at that point, you can think about what service providers you might want to or need to engage, depending on the scope, the data, everything else timing. Um, and then collection, it's gonna affect collection, of course, because now you know where your data is and you know the protocols for trying to get to it. Um, and then processing questions and then decommission all again, um, having that data map really gives you insight to every single one of these steps. And this is just a discovery response, really simplistic outline of a playbook. A playbook would be megs big, it would be quite large. Um, and it, there could be a playbook for um, many, many, many situations. So. Great. Terrific. Uh, thank you, KQ. Really interesting. I think <clears throat> there's a lot of uh, questions uh, and, and, and discussions that we go to go down the road for uh, data mapping, but given the amount of time, I think it's a good segue into our next topic, which is the legal X factor. And actually, we have a question from Torben for Justine. And so, Justine, you just brought up CCPA. <clears throat> Has CCPA changed processes, data mapping within your organization? Um, and I think with that, uh, it would be really great for you to, you know, continue on with the the data governance uh, building a privacy program discussion as well. Awesome. And I think that question by Torben, and I will invite KQ and Leo at, at once we tee up CCPA and CPRA to comment briefly within your own organizations, what does that look like? Because I am also curious, Torben, on how um, those amazing organizations have handled it. Um, so first, let me say, I hate sitting on stools. I'm a short girl. Mm -hmm. My feet always look really awkward. And always in live events, they love to put a stool. Um, but I'm delighted to hear legal is now included as a fourth leg. Um, and uh, so when you build out a data governance program, um, oftentimes legal will lead that because there are laws like CCPA and like CPRA that's on our ballot, those laws are driving compliance. So we talked about those three R's, what makes you rich and what ruins you. If you're just looking at that type of data and managing that data, then you, you know, we get questions all the time. Is there a law that requires us to do this? And information governance for many organizations, I will exempt publicly traded organizations because SEC has long required um, forms of data governance. Um, and I will also exempt uh, EU organizations because data governance looks different over there. But for the most part, most companies don't have this obligation to build out full data governance programs. And so the last, what, 10, 15 years, all of us in e-discovery land have really been doing this work. There hasn't been something, there hasn't been a law that says, yeah, but you have to do it. Um, certainly it makes it easier. Certainly compliance is easier, but it's not, um, has not been something that if you didn't do, you're going to get in big trouble. Um, that has changed. Um, the laws have changed. Privacy in general has become, um, you know, particularly during the pandemic, it has become a majorly um, important topic. And I would even say in the last three years, we've just seen a major shift of how we see and think of our data. I think for a lot of people, they thought, um, to the detriment of their companies, they thought that it just didn't matter to people, that people didn't care about their privacy anymore because their information was so widely available and because people are willing to put things out on social media um, that pe I think companies just thought of it differently. So um, when I think about the origins of privacy, California, and I, I love our state. I'm homegrown down here in San Diego. And when California in 1972 was the first state 
in the country to have a constitutional right to privacy. That comes on the heels of Roe v. Wade. It came on the heels of government snooping. You had the Pentagon Papers a couple years later. So there were just a ton of drama around it. And so privacy became important. There is no federal right to privacy, by the way. So once we know as an organization, what are you trying to hide? Um, it really becomes, you know, and, and again, think of those three R's, but just think about what would you not want somebody else to see? A competitor, maybe a bad guy, a threat actor who's going to do bad things, maybe other employees. You don't want uh, one employee to see the other employee's personnel file, right? So there's certainly things you have to think about strategically. And as from an architecture perspective, um, you can build in firewalls. So your organization is segmented that way. I just got a little feedback. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So let's talk next about the cost benefit analysis. And we, we touched on this. How do you appeal to budget? Right. So you definitely have this buy in from leadership, but you have to break it down. It's not enough to say we should do this. Well, the, how much is it going to cost and how do we as an organization um, analyze that? So CCPA is a law that was um, came around in 2018 very quickly. Uh, over the last couple of years, it's been uh, ironed out with various amendments. And now we've got a ballot initiative that purports to change everything uh, in November. We'll see how that shakes out. Um, so from a cost benefit analysis, though, CCPA was really important because what it did was it gave statutory damages and statutory damages between $100 and $750 per person. So if we know that, that's the number and you know how many customers or employees you have that you hold sensitive data on, then it's very easy to do that cost benefit analysis. So I, I use that as an example. You get a foothold and you get the attention real quick. If you got a, records on a million people, well, now you have potential damages for a million. And you can look at California residents um, and say, OK, well, we just have these California residents and that's how we're going to measure those damages. I, I personally think that uh, the statutory damage amount is going to be used as a foothold for application more broadly than just California residents. It's my um, crystal ball. We're starting to get into Halloween time, so I get out my, my witch's hat and my crystal ball. Um, so definitely document the cost benefit analysis. Second or third, <laughs> uh, decision makers and who do you have and why? That just looks different for your organization depending on, on your organization, right? If you're a, a medical device manufacturer um, or you have something that you're producing that's gonna connect to the internet um, and then you're gonna sell that, you should probably have somebody from engineering as part of these privacy security committees. Um, the data dictionary is so important. And we didn't, I've never used that term, but I am definitely stealing that, Leo, and using it um, because it's so, it, it so illustrates that when you have, you have to have diversity among your committee that's overseeing privacy and security because it's everybody's job now. It used to be privacy and security was the job of IT or InfoSec. And well, that's not our problem. We don't have to really understand that. It is every single person in the entire enterprise. And so as a result, you really need stakeholders from the various parts of the organization. Um, that way you can share, have the shared and common language. Let's just use personal information as an example. Personal information is going to mean something wildly different to HR, to InfoSec, to IT, to legal. And how do you come up with a way to track these evolving and emerging laws? So that's just a very difficult question that you want lots of people thinking about. Um, so it just depends on your organization and you just start the conversation. One thing I love to do with clients is I give them an insurance application for cyber insurance. And I say, sit down with people you think can complete this. And until you have every person sitting at the table that feeds in to understand the ecosystem, you, that, you, you don't have everybody at the table. Because usually they'll have like one or two people um, doing this application. And then they might call IT or when did we have our last, last audit? Get those people in the room to be talking about the problems and the solutions. Um, digital asset management, um, I call out social and emotional intelligence uh, data. And again, the digital asset management is just, we think differently about data now. Data presents risks, it prevent, presents benefits, and you have to figure out the risk and benefit, the reward, the cost, and then make a decision. Um, so it's really a project-based approach to data and how to manage it. 
Um, understanding data flows, um, and I, I steal this from the great Maya Angelou, if we know better, we do better. If we can understand how organization gets into the um, environment and how it gets out of the environment, who it's shared with. So you've got APIs on the backside that push and share data with third parties. Um, we will do better. It's so eye-opening. Run a run a ghostery or one trust analysis of your website. I promise you, you are going to find cookies and things on there that you had no idea were there. Tracking, targeted marketing, analytics, and that's publicly available, anybody can run it on your website. So we don't want to make plaintiffs and consumers more knowledgeable about our environment than we are. Um, reasonable security, gosh, whole separate conversation. Um, but it really is something that you can't really begin to secure data. And KQ, you made this wonderful point. You can't secure it if you don't know it's there. Um, and you certainly can't secure it if you don't know what who it's being shared with, right? Because you're going to shift and share that risk with those third parties. Um, legal updates. Yes, we have uh, laws on the move again. Uh, again, we have a ballot initiative. We could take a long time talking about that. But the short story is uh, be on the lookout November 3rd. Um, that proposed legislation... Um, well, it's a ballot initiative. It's not legislation. Um, it was brought by Alistair McTaggart, who wrote CCPA. What will fundamentally change on that are a couple things that interest me and I'm watching is uh, pr a, a commission that will be established. So you will have a separate commission with 50 people designated really overseeing privacy. Um, currently, that is uh, the attorney general's job. Um, and the second thing that's really interesting is many interesting things about CPRA. But the one that I have my eye on is the data retention piece. So now it says you have to have a program. You have to have processes. You have to have data retention schedules. And that is something, again, that is a law that is not here yet, but has a high likelihood of passing. But it is a whole lot of drama around that law. Very interesting to look it up. Um, and regulatory predictions. Um, I just want to be mindful of time. Um, I think that there's going to be more regulatory uh, inquiries and investigation because it's important to consumers and they're making a lot of complaints. Um, so. Uh, key takeaways, um, how do you mitigate risk in this environment? Just because a law says um, this is what you should do doesn't mean it should be your floor. Um, it is, uh, or I should say ceiling, should sure you have to do things, but look at where these laws are going. COVID data is an, a great example, contact tracing. So we can't predict uh, what these laws are going to do in the next 30 to 60 days, but they're proposed. So can you, on, say, contact tracing, build out a solution that contemplates what these changes might be? For example, well, we really want to keep this data for 30 to 60 days. OK, but this law says you can only keep it for 14 days. Well, keep it for 14 days. And then you can always adjust upwards. But start with the what might be coming and think about, can you just build a solution now that contemplates that? So when it's here, you're not trying to do it in a very quick uh, period of time. Um, so be thoughtful, be informed, attend events like this, follow, uh, you know, folks like John and Ryan Kennedy at Congruity and also the legal operators and just attend. I mean, we're sitting at home in yoga pants anyway. I feel like we might as well uh, get smarter. You know, what are these silver linings that we have to do? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm reminded by Charles Darwin, who said, you know, something along the lines of it's not the smartest, it's not the strongest, it's not the prettiest um, that will survive. It is those that are most flexible, most able to read their environment and make change. So um, don't try to be perfect. It's not a, a, a privacy perfect. It's a privacy practice. So keep practicing, eliminate, go after those big risks and um, and good luck. Thank you, Josine. <clears throat> I think you really highlighted how critical legal really is in building out any of these programs because there's absolutely no way that I'm reading CPRA and CCPA regulatory uh, laws or anything like that. So that's fantastic. So any final thoughts from the panel? We are, uh, we've got three minutes left. Um, you know, here's a summary slide, but Leo, we'll start with you. Any final thoughts from your side? Uh, now, first of all, was uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you, John, for putting this together. It's great to uh, assemble sort of a, I think the three of us look at the same issue uh, from very different perspectives, so they're very complementary. Uh, so it's great to hear Justine and PQ's uh, perspective on it. Um, I think that the 
to me, like the one thought that continues to come to mind is how can we, you know, help the, you know, advance the objective of a legal department, which is ultimately to protect the company by leveraging data, sort of proactively get at it. Maybe we'll just try to get to, to risks before they become issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, and address them. So I think we have an opportunity to go beyond just uh, driving efficiency, but really continue to enhance the effectiveness uh, of our team. Yeah, really love that. Um, thank you, Leo. KQ, any final thoughts? Yeah, just in regard to the, the data mapping, it can seem like a huge task. Um, and I think in our in the IG world, we use the, the term or the phrase, boil the ocean. Um, often, but you can really get great gains by picking a specific targeted demographic, whether it's a function or a department or, or what have you, and really build on it. Um, a data map can be as simple as a, a spreadsheet, but it will still give you uh, amazing insight and, and start you on the road to using a really great tool. Um, I echo the sentiments here. This was great. It was great to work with all of you um, and see the way that our different perspectives intersect. And, um, and I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, KQ. And Justine, any final thoughts on your, from you? Uh, you're on mute, uh, Justine. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think some people wish they could just mute me in their life all the time, but I wanted to thank you guys so much for the opportunity to learn from you and um, imitations, the ultimate flattery. So when I steal KQ and Leo's ideas, I want you to know I, it comes from a place of flattery that you're so smart. Um, so uh, Mahatma Gandhi um, said something along the lines of um, true happiness is when what you think, what you say and what you do are in harmony. So I pull that into cyber risk um, too often. Uh, we find that what is happening with data is not what we think is happening with data. It is certainly not what our privacy policy says is happening with data or our agreements say what are happening with data. And it is also, again, can be layered in with how we are actually sharing and using that data. So align them. The only way to do that is to really get in, dig in and understand it. Um, so thanks everybody for listening. Great. Thanks, Justine. And again, thanks to the entire panel. Special thanks to Mallory Maynard and Ryan Kennedy from my team for putting this together, helping to coordinate. And of course, uh, to Colin McCarthy at Legal Operators. Colin, with that, I think we're ready to wrap up. And Colin may lo no longer be there. So thanks Colin, again to everybody. I think, he's, yeah. I think he's there. I think he was just on mute. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, I just want to thank you guys so much, John, Justine, KQ, Leo. That, that was that was phenomenal. The insights were, were great. Like I, I feel pumped up for my day. Mahatma Gandhi, you know, uh, <laughs> Charles Darwin, and uh, Maya Angelou. It won webinar. You know that, that's just incredible. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> well, these lawyers are word thieves, Colin. You know. <laughs> I just want to thank um, all the attendees as well. Uh, you know, this is an hour of your time of your day, and we really appreciate it. We hope we're bringing you value with these uh, these webinars. And uh, I just want to thank uh, you, thanks sixty for making it possible. Uh, with that, um, last word to you, John, before I sign off. That's it. Uh, final webinar on uh, data governance for legal operators will be in November, and it will be an exciting topic about data classification. So hope you hope to see you then. Awesome. Thank Thanks, you everyone. all, guys. Have a great day. Take care. Me too. <laughs>